So in this video, I would like to take a look at monopolistic competition in international trade. Now, I want to draw a distinction between this and standard hexerolene Ricardian type uh, models. As you recall from earlier videos, the those two models basically had a few attributes. One, you had perfect competition um, among firms. You had an emphasis on countries being different from each other so that we would predict a lot of trade north-south develop developing world um, rather than among developed countries. Um, and the other thing is that we had what is called inter-industry trade. Now, what do, what do I mean by that? Inter-industry trade means that if a country exports, say, textiles, it doesn't import textiles as well. If it imports cars, it doesn't export cars as well. You tend to, countries will export goods from an industry or import goods from an industry, but not both. Now, the, the real world is actually not often characterized by those attributes of the hexerolene and Ricardian type world. That those models are useful for some types of trade, but they're not useful for everything. And so the story that we're going to be telling to, uh, today about monopolistic competition in international trade really is trying to uh, explain three important aspects of, of real world trade. One, that there's a significant amount of intra-industry trade. The United States both imports and exports chemicals. The United States both imports and exports automobiles. It both imports and exports electronic goods. And so this, this fact of intra-industry trade is not one that really is uh, explainable by the, the standard models. We also have an, an, a great amount of the trade in the international marketplace is among developed countries. U.S., Europe, Japan, Europe, Japan, U.S., Japan, Canada, and so forth. Korea, uh, now a, a, by all measures a developed country, have much more trade amongst themselves than, say, U.S., South Africa, or Europe, Egypt, or Japan, Burma. So we need other models to explain those behaviors. And also, the, the reality is that a lot of individual firms have pricing pow power, the ability to help set the prices by choosing the quantity, that is not really consistent with a, a perfect competition model. So, there's economists haven't just thrown up their hands saying, well, we can't really explain that. Instead, come up with a different set of models to explain a different set of relationships and one of the standard ones is monopolistic competition. And that is uh, very widely used in modern trade analysis. So I have a, a separate video about monopolistic competition, the just sort of standard story. So I'm not going to go through all the, um, uh, the details of this. I, I do want to uh, focus on a couple of aspects of this. One is that uh, we're talking about differentiated products where a firm will have a, quote, monopoly in the particular variety of products that they, that they make. We're going to have increasing returns to scale. In other words, average total cost is declining. As you produce more, you uh, costs go down. And on the consumer side of things, consumers value or like variety. You like being able to walk in and say, I don't want just three cars. I'd like to... Uh, or three car companies, I'd like to choose among 10, and I'd like to have different models uh, within that. So consumers like variety. So given this, this setup in the basic monopolistic competitions story, I want to think about a particular 
producer making a particular product, and you can think about this as, say, Ford producing cars. So this is the quantity of cars produced by Ford. Not the automobile market generally, but for Ford. You've got the price and costs of, of Ford. And the particular way that I'm going to have the uh, increasing returns to scale, again, you can look at this other video, is that we're going to have a fixed cost and constant marginal cost. The upshot of this is that the average cost curve is going to be downward sloping and we'll have, I don't want to draw that quite so low, and then we'll have a marginal cost which is um, constant. So, if we have this kind of, of setup with a, um, uh, the, uh, the monopolistic uh, competition model, we'll start out with a long-run equilibrium in autarky with zero economic Uh, profits. Again, look at that other video to, to get an explanation for this. Bottom line, uh, with this arrangement, is that you'll have a demand curve for Ford that uh, is going to be tangent to the average total cost curve. We'll come back to that in just a second. A quantity produced and then a marginal revenue curve for Ford. So we've got a price and a quantity. Now, uh, what's, what's notable about this? You price for price equal to marginal cost. After competition, domestic competition has come in, you've driven the uh, price uh, to the point such that price equal to average total cost, there's zero economic profits, and firms uh, end up choosing to produce that, that quantity. Again, you've had lots of you've had competition from, from domestic uh, sources to drive these economic profits to zero. Now we imagine that you have new international competitors producing similar goods. So, Ford is happily making sedans with GM and Chrysler as their uh, competitors, and then suddenly in comes Toyota and Nissan and other Japanese firms that produce a slightly different product, differentiated uh, from Ford by various attributes. It's not They're similar, but not exactly the same. They have four wheels, and they have a steering wheel, and they use gasoline, but they're different. Now, the, the upshot of competition of this type is that it's going to tend to cause the demand curve for Ford to become more elastic. It's going to become flatter. Domestic firms consume, purchasing Ford are going to be more sensitive to price when you've got more competition, more varieties from other Japanese sources. So if we look at the new long-run equilibrium when you have the new international competition, okay, so this is the demand for Ford with trade. Here is the new quantity of production. And then I'm going to draw the relevant marginal revenue curve. 
And so actually let me uh, have some points labeled here. A, A prime, B, B prime. So before the, the international competition, Q1 was being produced at this marginal revenue and a quantity such that the price equal to average total cost of zero economic profits in the long run equilibrium. International competitors come in. After everything sorts out, there is going to be a new equilibrium where price equal to marginal, uh, price equal to average total cost at point B, just like it is at point A. So the zero uh, there's zero economic profits. You have uh, production expanding, in this case by Ford, and a um, and lower average cost of production. So a couple of things to, to note here. What this story will tell you is that the, the new competition tends to drive down costs in the domestic market because of the, the international competition. You're going to have a you're going to have lower prices. So domestic consumers have lower prices. You're going to have more variety in the domestic market. You're going to have more uh, versions of similar cars. So consumers get benefits associated uh, uh, with this. So this story is about expanding the production, lowering the costs of Ford. Now, one of the things to be clear about it may be that Ford's overall share of the total market inside the United States for automobiles may go down. Okay, so they may have a reduction in their share even as their costs go down and, and their production goes up because you've got lots more varieties, lots more uh, car firms operating in, inside the domestic market. So this is the basic story with uh, monopolistic and international trade, which says that there's another reason why you might want to have uh, international trade it, because of the cost reductions and because of the, um, the increased variety. And this is the, uh, the basic story of that alternative to the standard perfect competition, uh, hexarolene, Ricardian type uh, framework.